Thanks, Talitha. Right, hopefully you can see a slideshow come up on the screen now. Um, I think I've shared it right. Hopefully I have. Anyway, um, yes, my name is Sue Hayes and I'm a subject and curriculum advisor for Learning by Questions. Um, just uh, cover these introductions first of all. So I, uh, I've been a teacher for over 15 years in the math classroom. Six of those were as a head of department. Uh, my current role involves writing question sets and content for Learning by Questions, uh, specifically for secondary maths. And I do still teach at some local football academies and I do some tutoring as well. So I like to keep my hand in and get my maths uh, teaching fix. And I'd like to introduce today um, a teacher from a local secondary school and a friend of LBQ, Emma Tranta. We can't see her. She's the mysterious Emma Tranta today because her video is not working. And I do just want to say a quick hello. Hello. Nice to be here. There we go. <laughs> Emma's got a wealth of knowledge and I will be picking her brains in a minute through the session. Um, so as Talitha mentioned before, it's very much a sharing of practice uh, session today. We are aware that we'll have a wealth of uh, knowledge in the audience. So please feel free, free to pop uh, your views and opinions in the chat and we'll come back to them uh, in the Q&A session later on. OK, um, so oh, and one thing as well, we will be doing um, the interactive bit as well. So just clicking through very quickly, um, we've got the uh, we'll be talking about inclusive teaching and what we think it is. Um, how you can make your classroom more inclusive. We'll be looking at who our invisible children are and reason why they possibly become invisible. And as Talitha mentioned before, we will have this interactive session um, where we'll get you onto the platform and trying a couple of our question sets. Um, therefore, you get the experience of what it's like to be a pupil. You'll see the type of feedback they get question by question, and you'll also see the data that that generates and how we can use it. Once we've gone through that, Emma and I will talk about that quite extensively because Emma's got so much input on, on that particular um, aspect of things. Uh, and then we'll have the question and answer session. So it's quite a lot to get through. So we'll plow on. So first of all, what is inclusive teaching? Uh, well, first of all, I found this quote, um, it was from uh, Imperial College London, actually, and it just says, inclusive learning and teaching recognises that all students entitlement to learning experience that respects diversity, enables participation, removes barriers, and anticipates and considers a variety of learning needs and preferences. So it's quite a comprehensive quote, and there's an awful lot to try and achieve there in one classroom. Um, there is so much to consider when trying to establish an inclusive environment for pupils. And today we're going to look at ways you can empower yourself to do this. Uh, it's sometimes easier to consider inclusivity from the point of view of the differences that may exist between pupils rather than those things that they have in common. For instance, their personalities, backgrounds, their needs and attitudes to learning, to name but a few of the differences they may have. Coming to you, Emma, what are the biggest challenges, in your opinion, when trying to ensure inclusivity in your classroom? I think one of the biggest things is simply time. And I know there was a, a period in time where we were told um, as a staff in school that we had to make sure that we asked every PP pupil in your class a question every lesson. Yeah, yeah. Sounds and familiar. My, my biggest fear at that point was, well, if I do that, am I going to then just ignore every other pupil? Yeah. If you're not PP, will you just never answer any questions? Yeah. Because every lesson I've got to ask PP. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes we're so busy trying to make sure that we hit pupils that are target pupils for whatever reason, whether that's SEND, whether that's PP, whether it's because we know they come from an EAL background or whatever it might be. Are we so busy trying to make sure we include them that actually what we do is exclude a whole other bunch of pupils because they don't have some kind of particular need. Yeah, I was I was thinking about the labels we give pupils before, and sometimes if you if you don't have a label, do you disappear? What what happens? Yeah, I think that's really pertinent, Emma. Thank you. Um, and I guess when we're, when we're trying to ensure inclusivity, it becomes about establishing a common goal and purpose that we can all work towards, despite what labels we have. Um, so. What are your tips, Emma, for making your classroom an inclusive environment? Have you got any uh, nuggets there? Um, for me, one of the things has always been doing a lot of work on mini whiteboards because then I can see an answer from every pupil. Um, and that's always been really key because then actually if I can see that those pupils with labels, whatever they may be, are actually doing the questions correctly and they're happy, I don't need to worry about them. I have questioned them. I have seen their answers. And I can then focus on someone who's struggling, who might be someone who doesn't have a label, like we say. 
Yeah. Um, so that's been really helpful. And the other thing that has been a massive game changer for me is LBQ, just simply because, again, I can see everybody's answers and I know who I need to target from a maths perspective. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. If, if something is actionable, you can do something about it, can't you? If you no, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, nice one. Thanks, Emma. Um, right, so I'm just going to move forward a little bit and just a few tips on how to make your classroom inclusive. Obviously, Emma's giving you some really, really good insights there. I'm looking at some more general things at the be to begin with here. Um, and I've come up with eight key attributes, but this is by no means exhaustive because there is so much you, you can do to make your classroom feel more inclusive. Um, the first thing I sort of alluded to was a, a calm atmosphere. And admittedly, this can be tricky in a secondary school. We all know that. Um, however, if you've got a calm atmosphere, it ensures that your classroom is welcoming and it's as stress free as possible. And so much of this comes from you as the teacher, welcoming pupils in at the door, saying it's nice to see you, there's works on the desk ready for you, just make a start when you're in. Um, it all sets the tone for the lesson. Uh, making sure that your first interaction with pupils is a positive one is so important. Um, the next thing I sort of thought about was trying to make sure that everyone feels that they are accepted. And again, this level of acceptance comes from you. For instance, if you had a bad lesson with a pupil one week where, say, you got to stage three on your behaviour policy, welcoming them at the door and rather than saying, you coat off, are we going to have a better lesson today? You simply say, just take your coat off before you go in. Thanks. This resets the tone of the interaction with them and demonstrating the slate's been wiped clean and without drawing attention to the fact that you're fully aware of how badly they behaved the lesson before, it gives the pupil very little reason to act out again. Um, both of these uh, sort of feed into a positive environment where pupils feel welcomed and valued in your classroom. And again, all of this hopefully feel it feeds into the fact that it should be a, sp a safe space for everyone. The positivity, acceptance and calm environment should ensure this. We should not underestimate how challenging some pupils find secondary school environments. Since COVID especially, where pupils have embraced their introverted nature but have now been thrown back into an ex extroverted world, it can feel really overwhelming. Simply turning up to lessons can take a lot of courage in some cases. Therefore, if these pupils feel that they are safe and secure, all of their focus can be on the teaching and learning that takes place during the lesson, rather than any other concerns that they may have. Um, also looking at teamwork and collaboration. It's so important for building that acceptance in the classroom between peers, um, allowing pupils to work on certain tasks collaboratively, whether in small, small groups or pairs, can be really beneficial. That's not to say that all work should be completed like this, but it can prov prov uh, prove useful in promoting acceptance by all of, in the classroom. You know your pupils, though, and you know the characters in your group. And initially, um, I would say considerable thought needs to be put into who you are grouping together. Hopefully, if it works over time, you'll end up with more diverse mixes in your groups. But you do need to be careful with that initially. Um, the other thing I would uh, make sure happens is that question asking questions is encouraged. I remember being absolutely terrified of asking a question in my math class all those years ago, or a lot of years ago, as the teacher was really scary, to be honest, and she would belittle anyone who is brave enough to ask a question. Um, I was never brave enough and then therefore probably had loads of misconceptions uh, that lingered as a result. Um, welcoming a seemingly straightforward question about the topic in hand can reassure others that it's okay to ask and gives you the opportunity of digging a bit deeper of the area of misunderstanding. Of course, there'll always be some pupils who don't want to ask at all um, or even have much interaction in class, but we'll come back to that. Um, the other thing, I think it's really important, and this comes to Emma's point about the mini whiteboards a little bit, making mistakes is okay. Certain pupils are so worried about making mistakes that it can really limit their potential. As at some point they've felt or been told that making mistakes is a bad thing. And alluding to what Emma's just said, I remember a particular group of girls in one of my classes who responded so much better to mini whiteboard tasks than anything else. And I asked them why, and it was because they could wipe clean what they'd done wrong. And that, that was a huge thing for them. So we know that making mistakes isn't a bad thing, of course, but it is one of the ways um, that we learn most effectively. Turning a mistake into a point of learning is a key skill. For instance, if a pupil gives a response to a percentage question as four fifths, it can be highlighted as a positive. So as a teacher, you can say, oh, right, you've given your answer as a fraction of four fifths. Brilliant. You're nearly there. What else do you need to do? Um, so you can 
say that you've seen that they've, they've clearly done the working to get that far, but then you can get the rest of the class involved and then other people will say, well, turn it into percentage. How are we going to do that? Well, we could use equivalent fractions. We could say that I know that's a decimal of 0.8, therefore it's a percent. You can just really underline the, the teamwork ethos that you want in your classroom and, and praise the workings that have been done so far. So all of these sort of quite general things can come together um, and highlight hopefully that everyone has potential and everyone should have that self-belief, regardless of their background, race, personality, gender, bend, anything. Every pupil should feel that they can achieve in your classroom. Um, now, as part of the discussion today, we are going to be focusing on the invisible child. Now, since COVID, a lot of educational literature refers to the invisible, uh, refers to those pupils who are no longer visible in school in the school system as invisible children, i.e. they're not attending school anymore or they're doing so very sporadically. However, when I'm reversing, referring to invisible children, I'm talking about those pupils who are present in your lesson, but who may prefer to remain invisible in the classroom. And this makes engagement, progress, and simply understanding what makes them a bit more of a challenge. Um, so I just want you to think about one of your classes, preferably one of your bigger classes of so 30 plus pupils. Could you write down the name of everyone in your class? And this again comes to what Emma was saying before about asking PP kids questions and, and things like this. If I was doing this um, as a part of a planning exercise for a lesson, the first few pupils I would think of would be my behaviour concerns, probably. I'd be thinking, right, I've got those three children who've got key behaviour issues. If I can make sure they're on task, my classroom is calm, it's no one's getting distracted, that's, that's the first thing I want to do. The next group of pupils I'll probably think about would be those weaker pupils, the ones who I'm anticipating are going to struggle with the content. And therefore, I'd be looking for what scaffolding I'm going to put in place, are there any extra bits of use I need to do for them. Then I would probably look at my more able students, the ones who I'm expecting to do a little bit of extra work. And then I'll be looking at PP students. That still may leave me with probably around 20 pupils in my class that I haven't paid specific attention to. So it's never a conscious decision to overlook pupils and make them feel invisible, but simply that other ch children in the class sometimes demand more of your time. So the people who are invisible may be typically introverted. That was probably me in the classroom back in the day. Um, don't want to draw attention to themselves. They're often quite quiet and conscientious and therefore you, you don't really notice that they, they need you. you know, you're not necessarily aware that they may need you. Um, they may do just enough to stay under the radar. So again, you might just think that they're, you're, you're not needed by them. Um, and you may find that they underperform in assessments. And it's only at that assessment stage that you actually think, oh, hang on, I, I thought they knew what they were doing. So we need to ask ourselves, how well do we actually know these children and how well they're progressing? Do we, do we have that information to hand? Um, looking at reasons why children become invisible, and there's lots of reasons. Um, they, they're teenagers for a start and they're going through all this teenage angst and they just want to disappear. I know I've got teenagers at home at the moment and that's frequently uh, what happens. Um, they may not want to get things wrong, so they don't even try. Um, as they behave well, it may seem that they don't need help. So they become invisible by the fact that they're behaving well and you, you think that it's not an issue. They may actively resist interaction in a class. We've all asked the question as teachers and then looking around the classroom and you can see that those people who are, no, I'm not going to look at you. There's no way I'm making eye contact. You're not going to ask me that question. Um, so you've got those who actively resist the inter interaction. Um, you'll all have seen the impact of COVID and what that has had on uh, the mental health of children um, in the classroom. Um, was there another one? There was. Um, and but they don't have a label. Obviously, I was discussing with Emma before about the, all the different labels they have. And sometimes if a pupil doesn't have a label, does that just mean they, they disappear? Um, so, Emma, I know you've already mentioned, what, what experiences have you had of invisible children in your classroom? It's exactly that. It's those pupils who just don't want attention drawing to them for whatever reason, whether they're self-conscious about something, whether that's how they look, whether that's their ability in maths, or they're more likely their their perceived ability in maths, because yeah. often they're very wrong about that. Um, and for me, they, they do exactly as you were saying, they do perhaps just enough to get by. And it's only when you assess that you discover that they really haven't got a clue but it's yeah. also those pupils that in the past perhaps would have sat and looked like they were working 
but yeah. were they really? And it is that because they're behaving and they're doing a really good impression of looking like they're working, yeah. you assume they're fine. And if asked, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And they do it to a T, don't they? They've got it so yeah. off part. They're, they're brilliant at it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all the time. Thank you, Emma. Um, okay, so we're now going to sort of move on and have a quick look at how LBQ can help you uh, in your lessons. We're going to move on to the interactive section just after this slide. So uh, it's going to get really interesting there. So LBQ gives you insights, um, instant insight into the progress and understanding of all your pupils in the class. Um, basically, once you've selected an appropriate task and set it running, pupils work independently through our carefully structured question set. All our question set authors are qualified teachers. And the question sets are specifically designed to guide pupils through from the simple to the complex. Um, pupils get feedback for every single question and the feedback is writ written specifically for each question. It's not that we just do a generic video around the topic. It is, no, you've got that question wrong. So it's that question or that misconception that we're going to address in the feedback. Um, there is also image support, which helps the children tackle any minor misconceptions that they have. So all of these points, enable the pupils for the most part to overcome most of the queries themselves. The wonderful part about this is it buys you some time in the classroom to observe your own lesson and all the pupils in it. What you have is you have a live data matrix coming through and it allows you to see pupils, every pupil's response to every question. So you have a clear understanding how, of how every ch child is progressing or not, as the case may be. You also get a sense of their depth of understanding, meaning that you can intervene in the moment as needed. OK, so the best way to get this across, it's all very well me saying that, but until you actually see it in, in practice, you, you don't get the idea. So I'm going to ask you now to go to uh, a new tab, please. If you can put in the URL www.lbq.org forward slash task um, and then enter this code. So it's M8DB. Pop the code in. You then it'll then ask for your name so just pop your name in as well um once you've done that and you've pressed enter it will take you to two different tasks you've got two to choose from there i've done i've selected task one is a mathematics one which is on the area of a trapezium and task two is a biology question set on asthma so you can pick which one you want to do i don't mind which one you do um so yeah have a go, see what you can do. What I am going to ask you to do is um, get a few questions wrong, though, please. OK, so if you get the questions wrong, you'll see what the incorrect feedback looks like and how we aim to nudge the, the children forward, specifically answering the, the bit that they've got wrong. I'm going to be quiet for a bit, let you go on with that. I'll leave that um, on there for a moment. And I think Tal's going to pop the code in the chat as well, just in case you forget what it is. All right, I'll let you get on with that. Thank you to those of you joining. I can see lots of you are getting in on the area of a trapezium one. Let's have a look at the science one. Oh, and on the biology one as well. We've got a chunk of people there. It's lovely. Lovely to see a mix of colours as well. We're getting some greens, which are uh, correct responses straight away. We're getting lots of yellows. We like yellows at Learning by Questions. It means that they've read the feedback and then they've acted on it and they've improved. So that's all good as well. I'll just let you really get into it. Remember, do try and get a couple of questions wrong as well. I know it goes against the grain. We don't, we don't like making uh, those mistakes, although we know it's good. We've just we've decided this. Um, so do make some mistakes if you can. Um, I'm going to leave it running for a little while longer as well so you can get a sense for the progression through the question set. You should be seeing that the questions are getting notably more difficult as you run through. Um, and once you've got seven questions correct on the maths one in the first level, it'll automatically move you on to the fluency level, where again, you should see that the progression is it's getting notably 
uh, trickier. It's going to challenge you a little bit more. Okay, right. What I've done now is I've just paused you all. I've just spoiled all your fun and uh, just stopped you in your tracks, which uh, usually gets a groan in the classroom, actually, um, is, which is lovely to hear because it's like you realise you've just moaned at me because I've uh, just stopped you doing some maths. Um, okay, so what we're looking at on screen now is the data matrix. Um, that is produced um, as a byproduct of running a question set, really. Um, so the red data matrix ensures that no child is overlooked as it provides an insight into the progress of everyone in the lesson, as can be seen here. I've got all the pupils down the side, I've got all the question numbers, and I can see how they've done on every question. This means that the invisible children, along with everyone else, can be given support, encouragement, and acknowledgement quietly and privately. Um, you don't need to ask in class, embarrassing them. You can figure out, oh, actually, I think this pupil number 37 may need a little bit of help. You can go and see them in a discreet manner um, and start engaging with them and, and, and developing that relationship a little bit more. Um, so if we just dig a little deeper into this uh, data here, um, and I've just, I'm sure Emma might, won't mind me saying this, but I have seen Emma use learning by questions in the classroom. It was, it was a couple of years ago now, it was pre-COVID. Um, but one of the biggest things, well, there were two big things that I noticed. First of all, it was a year 10 group, which possibly had the potential to, to maybe act out a little bit. But the sheer volume of questions they got done was amazing. But also how effective Emma was in using this data matrix. She instantly zoned in on the people who needed her. So not just our perception of who needs us as teachers, but who definitely needed her help and her input. And she could go and she could really address the, the key issues at hand. Um, I'm going to come to you here, Emma. What key things would you uh, pick out on this data matrix, would you say? Okay, so I would be looking for any pupils who were particularly struggling. So at the moment, I'd be looking at pupil 14, who's had three goes at question five. Love it, yep. Um, and I'd be going and talking to whoever that is and having a chat with them and seeing if we can sort that out. But I'd probably have intervened before that because question five seems to have been a problem full stop. So okay. I'd intervened and paused a little while ago and perhaps talked about question five on the board excellent and what emma's highlighted there is because you can see over the, the the numbers at the top highlight to you which questions as a whole the group are potent, potentially find is difficult so as a teacher you can be very proactive either with individuals or as emma's just said with the whole class and you can pause you can then view the responses, you can view the question, you can see what's going on. So there's an awful lot of interactivity with the system. Um, but it's this data dashboard that gives you that insight so that you can be really more proactive and more, you can just zoom in. It almost gives you a superpower of seeing where the pupils are struggling and knowing exactly where they need some help. So I'm going to I'm going to set those questions that's going now and I hope it doesn't mean that you just ignore the rest of the, the webinar, but we'll see. Um, I'm just going to go back to my slides. Um, if I can just see my slideshow, bear with me one sec. OK, so you've seen a little bit of learning by questions now. We're just going to sort of talk about that now in relation to um, how learning by questions can help you see the invisible time. A child. And just going to talk this through with Emma, um, really. So I've highlighted a few um, benefits for pupils. Um, the first one I've just sort of said, they can work through independently. Um, do you see that in your classroom, Emma? Do you see that there is a bit more independence sometimes? I do see a lot more independence, but I also see some really effective collaboration. And I think listening to the conversations that pupils have about the questions, yeah. as time's gone on, they've become far better and those conversations are far more insightful, particularly when we get to the reasoning and the problem solving tasks. I was going to say, yeah, is that, that's, that's one of the reasons I've kind of left it running. So hopefully some people can get some of the, some of the reasoning problem solving tasks. They're really nice to write those questions because we can just, we've got the time to dig a little deeper and they are really challenging, I think, some of them. Definitely. And yeah, some of the um, GCSE higher question sets, the problem solving questions in there really are as good as an exam question. 
yeah, make yeah. Them think, which is really great. Yeah, and it's, it's it's what you need, isn't it? So you know you can you you're covering the the main body of your class with the the sort of fluency level, but you've always got that extension, that real challenge uh, in there as well. Um, what was the other thing? The next thing I sort of pick, picked up on was about the feedback given. Do you find that the the pupils react to the feedback well? They do. It's training them, first of all, to read it, yeah. um, because all too often they say, oh, I've had three goes at this and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And you say, well, what did the feedback say? Yeah. What feedback? Well, every time you got it wrong, yeah. it said something to you. Oh, yeah. right. So you just click retry instantly. You're not reading the feedback. Um, so once they get used to the idea that that's there, then yes, absolutely. They do go, oh, I forgot to put meter squared or whatever it might be. Yeah, I think the thing that we try and do when we're writing the feedback as well, it's exactly what you've said. I know some things, some uh, packages, you'll get the question wrong because you've not put the units in. What we'll try and feed into that is say, you've calculated correctly, but you've just forgotten to put the units. So it's not that really annoying thing thinking, well, is it, did I get the whole thing wrong? Um, and, and that type of thing. I think as well with the feedback, it's, it's hopefully in, in respect of the invisible child, it hopefully alleviates the, the need for them to have to put their hand up, which they are dreading doing and possibly choose not to do. And it just gives them that nudge without having to, to ask the teacher necessarily. And equally, as you had just highlighted before, when we looked at the data matrix, as a teacher, you already know. You already know if they're struggling. And you do. You, you already have, know. Yeah. You have that. I think yeah. one of my favourite quotes mm. from a pupil was uh, about the feedback was a pupil saying it's like having your own personal teacher within the computer telling you what it is you've done wrong that's fab that's so nice to hear because do you know what the, the writing of the feedback is the hardest bit to do the writing of the questions is relatively straightforward we know what we're aiming for we know what we're getting taking them I know because I've had a go <laughs> yeah it's really hard and I, I used to think I just think well what would I say in class I'd, I'd, and I wouldn't I'd, I'd point at things or I'd say, well, what did you do on the last question? But you can't do that when you're writing feedback. So that's really nice to hear. That's lovely to hear. Uh, right, what else did I pop on this slide? Um, yeah, so the pupils can attempt the question as many times as needed, which is something that we've left in. And again, it comes back to that mistake, making a mistake. We're not bothered about, we're not really not bothered about you making a mistake because if you read the feedback and you act on it, um, then it's all good. So we've left it that they can answer the question as many times as they'd like. What do you think the pupils think about that, Emma? I think they like it very much. It is that satisfaction of, oh, well, I might have struggled with that one, but I've got it right. And now I've got that right. I know how to do the next one. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's it. And I, I do emphasise to pupils when we're perhaps using um, a question set that I've put together as revision for an assessment, yeah. I do emphasise, try and make sure that you take your time and get them right first time. Because remember, yeah. when you're doing the test tomorrow, your first answer is likely to be the one I've done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think as well, I know some other teachers have sort of said, you really need to be making sure you're not going more than three three responses in kind of thing so there's, there's lots of ways you can adapt that as a teacher isn't there and and choose how you're going to do that um but I, I do think it's nice that they can answer it as many times as they need to and it's that reassurance and I think what you alluded to as well is that it's that I've persevered and you know what I got it though I got there and it's, it's that building of, of self-confidence and yes you can get there just keep going um the other thing I thought about they can see as well how they're progressing across the top and Depending, I'm going to ask you this question, Emma, then. How often do you show the data dashboard in class as they're working through? What's, what's your view on that? Sometimes, but not very often. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm more likely, actually, to show it right at the end, particularly right. if it all work really well, and it's a really fabulous set of results. I will show them a really fabulous yeah. set of results at the end. Um, but sometimes I do have it on the board, and I will say... I'm expecting everybody to be round about such a question. Yeah. And you can see most people are. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. And again, I, do share, I tend to share it without names. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, You've got all these different options, haven't you? But yeah, I think absolutely that's, that's a good way to go. Um, and regardless of that, they can always see it just across their own personal screen, can't they, as well? Yeah. Um, are there any other benefits that you um, can think of for um, pupils? Can I mention the alternative dashboard? Because I like being able to see how long it is since people answered. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, definitely. It's 
the the thing um, I have just put um, on their intervention is informed and private. But yeah, the big thing for teachers is that they can be an informed and private thing. It can be that I sidle over to someone and say, "It's six minutes since you answered anything. Are you really stuck, or have yeah. you just been sitting doing nothing?" Yeah, and I think that comes back to what you said before, Emma, about when you, when you're just doing a normal lesson and they're staying under the radar and they're perhaps doing just enough, or they look like they're working hard. And when you've asked them something, they say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, Miss, I'm fine." You, as a teacher, you've done pretty much all you can to check that they are working, and and the realization that they didn't work comes when they do the assessment. You've got the realization there in class, haven't you? If they've not engaged with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. I've tried to come up with now for the next slide, um, just the sort of benefits of learning by questions for teachers. Um, so again, we'll talk through these points and obviously add anything you think, Emma. Um, I think this is probably the biggest one. It's you can see the progress being made or not, as the case may be. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I think you know exactly where everybody is up to. Yeah. And it's, it's just something you just don't get to know. You have an inkling. You can when when you're doing a textbook exercise or actually exercise, something, you have an inkling of where people are, but you don't have it there as in you've answered five questions and I can see you've got them all wrong. Um, you know, you just don't have that insight with something that isn't using a live data dashboard, I guess. Um, the other thing. Uh, oh, the one you just mentioned, it's almost like you've seen these slides <laughs> um, when people are off task. It's the, the, the good thing that you can see they've not answered for so long and then you can obviously go and jump in and give them some help if they need to. Um, yeah, we alluded to this when you were uh, talking about the data dashboard and the analysis that we've got from the tasks that we set here, that question five. You yeah. can spot misconceptions both with the whole class where you can you know, obviously interrupt everyone and pause them all or um, obviously in independently as well. And I think that's one of the biggest things because as a teacher, you've done your teaching point at the beginning. There's been no questions. You assume everyone's OK. And sometimes it's something that you, you thought they got well. And it just it's, it's all, almost a bit of a light bulb moment for yourself thinking, oh, I thought you understood that. And I always know. remember a particular lesson I did using mm. graphs um, question set and yeah. I really thought that we got the hang of um, whether it was positive or negative correlation and using a line of best fit and reading from this line of best fit. And I, I really thought we got it and we set off on yeah. this. And within two minutes, everything fell apart and everything was red and it was a disaster. Yeah. But what I realised from that, because I could see it so instantly, was that the scatter graph issue and the line of best fit issue wasn't the problem. The problem right. was they couldn't read the scale. Right, right, yeah, which you know what? Because it actually was a light bulb moment of, it's not the concept of the task they're trying to do that they can't do, it's really yeah. And the, uh, it always amazes me, Emma, that, that that remains a really tricky thing for a lot of children, quite high up into secondary school, doesn't it? Yeah. Judging what scale is, and it's something that as a teacher, no, surely, surely you know that. And it's, well, surely you can see that it's halfway between there and there, so it's... I and I was really sort of like, my God, oh my goodness, that's what the issue is. Yeah. And had that been a, a sort of old fashioned paper based task, they'd all have got it wrong. I'd have marked it and it would all have been wrong. But I'd have never known that that was why I'd have assumed they were doing something wrong in terms of their line of best fit or reading from it. Yeah. That, yeah. that was the bit that was wrong, not the scale. And the beauty of that as well, Emma, is the speed at which you found out that there was that issue. Absolutely. And what I actually did was stop that question set and yeah. use questions get on reading from scales. Okay. And we did about 20 minutes on that and then went back. Yeah. Problem solved. It was brilliant. Yeah. And that's the thing. You've got you've got all the question sets at, at hand, haven't you? So yeah. you can change tag, right? Lesson plan out the window. We're going to yeah. do something else because the need's there. That's that's perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, oh, just brought me on to this one. <laughs> so yeah, question sets, you can use them to challenge or support your pupils. Obviously, you use, you use it to support your pupils in that case. But equally, if you've got some pupils that are racing through and, and finding, you know, doing really well at the work, you can set something that's, that's going to challenge them a bit more or, you know, retrieve something from a few weeks ago, I guess, uh, if that was uh, going to be useful. At the beginning, I'd like these people to do the blue task and these people to do the pink task. 
Yeah, absolutely. Based on what you've seen, and you can yeah use your track yeah. to see where they're at. Absolutely. And they um, don't know from that because it's just a colour. They've no idea from that whether they're in a better or a worse group. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's really nice to do. Um, and what Emma's alluding to there is you can set three, any three question sets running at one time. Obviously, I had two tasks running, um, so you can choose what you need to there. Um, and I mean, I don't know what you think, Emma. What's what is the most valuable bit of learning by questions? Is it the live data? Live data, absolutely. Yeah. Live data. Yeah, because it just I think before I finish a lesson, I know where I want the next lesson to go. Yeah, so it's helping you plan in the moment as you're yeah, working. The, the, it, it's done the marking, and because I've used it in the lesson and reacted to it, yeah, I've also done my planning in my head. Yeah, absolutely. It's and I think it just the live data for me, and it, particularly so when I saw you using it in that lesson, it just means that you can be the most effective teacher because you've got all this additional information coming to you that you didn't know before that you can act on straight away. And like you say, you, you sort of, you know what your starting point is going to be for next time. Um, and there's, yeah, it just gives you an awful lot of stuff there. It does. Thank you so much, Emma. I think we've, we've done everything to death there. So thank you very much for your input. Um, tell us, how is the chat going? Is there any questions or anything? Well, it is hopping at the, yeah. at the chat. <laughs> I hope I've answered everybody's questions. There were a lot of questions that were about the platform, so um, I've tried to answer those over on the chat. One of the things I um, wanted to ask, especially um, whilst we have Emma here, um, was about the value. So it's it's two hundred and fifty pound per teacher um, for the year, and I just wondered if Emma, you could just talk a little bit about the value that you get from it. <laughs> um, I, I said this recently to someone um, talking to teachers from another school who'd come to have a look at it in action. I wouldn't now consider moving to a school that didn't have it. So that's how much value I put on it. Um, but I think just. The saving in paper, <laughs> just think of all those worksheets that you're not printing off. Yeah. Um, that's a huge thing. But I don't think you can put a price on the saving of teacher time yeah. and teacher efficacy. I think that's the absolutely huge thing that we're actually so much more efficient in the room. I don't get to the end of a lesson and think, well, I never really found out how Fred was doing because you have Fred was doing all the way through yeah mm. and on chat there's just um one quote that says do your uh, students have devices and they, they do, do don't yeah. they have a one -to -one scheme so all pupils have a device all the time yeah yeah um and I also wanted to share some some really good suggestions that we had earlier on in the webinar about um how um people are making their classroom more inclusive. Um, so we have, I'm sorry, I've, I've had to copy and paste because the chat was moving so quickly and some names are missing. So I'm really sorry to those people that made these suggestions, but um, somebody said, I think it was Suzanne said, um, we'll often thank a student if they've made a mistake or say, I was hoping that someone would make that mistake, which is just so lovely. I wish a teacher had said that to me when I was at school. It just um, reinforces that it's okay, doesn't it? It does fine. Yeah. Good, yeah. Yeah. And then um, Stephanie, who, who, who's uh, had to bob off the webinar, said, we give merits for good questions. And I also give them for mistakes when the reasoning behind it showed valid thought processes. If not, I'll just say no mistakes equals no learning, which is just yeah. exactly right, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Well, I think I think that's everything from um, from the chat. Um, so uh, I'm going to take over the screen now, uh, if it will let me. <laughs> um, I've stopped sharing, haven't I, I think. Second, here we go. So if you are interested in trialing Learning by Questions, you can do that for free. Um, and you can go on to our 14 day trial, which you could go on to tomorrow and you can just get started and get going. Or you can go on to our LBQ supported six week free trial, 
which is a bit more personalized. We provide you with support throughout, a little bit of training on how best to use the platform. And for that, you book a date and time and then we can um, run through everything with you. If you are interested in an LBQ supported trial, please just put your email address in the chat and I will come to you, uh, we'll come to you personally um, to book in a date and time for that. If not, you can go, you can visit this, uh, this web address, which I'll just put in the chat now. Um, and that will, that will take you to, I'm saying I'll put it in the chat and now I can't see the chat. I'm going to stop sharing now, but if you go to lbq.org forward slash try lbq, you can uh, bob on the trial there. And just thank you to absolutely everybody who's attended today. Thank you very much to Sue and especially Emma. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your great experience. It's, it's always lovely to have another voice on the panel. So thank you very much for that. Um, if you're interested, there is another webinar next week, next Thursday, that's on behaviour and engagement. And uh, yeah, it's our last webinar for game time. Sue, we're nearly there. <laughs> oh. um, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody.